Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. I've been working on my HF transmitter project and I've got the second mixer complete and I've collected a lot of performance data on how it works. Let's check it out. Let's begin today's episode with a refresher of what exactly the second mixer does and talk about what design I've chosen for it. I covered some of the stage back in episode number three, but I did leave a few details hanging and I have evolved the design since then. On the block diagram we can find it right here. It's right after the IF chain and before the second bandpass filter. In a nutshell, its job is very simple. It takes two input signals, the 5.5 MHz intermediate frequency, which contains voice or CW information, and a variable frequency signal, or VFO, and outputs the voice or CW information on the desired transmission frequency. Now, I went through the math of how to select a VFO frequency back in episode number one in this series, so I'm not going to repeat that explanation here. Here's the design that I've built. There's nothing particularly extraordinary about it. I'm using a very common diode ring mixer, an ADE-1ASK in this case, as the core element to mix the IF and VFO signals. That's the same mixer that I used in my HF receiver project series. Now as I understand it, one of the more critical gotchas with using diode ring mixers correctly is to ensure you maintain a good impedance match at its output. If you do not, you can end up with mixer byproducts being reflected off your downstream circuit and fed back into the mixer for more mixing and creation of spurious products. And in severe cases, those spurious products can be so close to your transmitted frequency that they're not removable by downstream filters. So one simple solution presented in figure 5.33 of EMRFD is to use a common gate JFET amplifier at the mixer output, in this case a J310. It doesn't provide much gain, around 5 dB in the manner that I biased it, but it does provide good isolation for the mixer output. Let me show you what I mean. Here's a simple LT Spice simulation of that amplifier. I'm showing two plots here. The topmost plot shows how the input impedance varies over a frequency spread from 1 MHz to 30 MHz. Notice that it doesn't vary more than about plus or minus 10 ohms from a nominal 50 ohms. And also notice the gain. It stays pretty flat at around 5 dB, especially from around 4 MHz and up. The second simulation takes a closer look at how the input impedance responds when various output load impedances from 5 ohms to 600 ohms are applied. The input impedance never gets worse than about 88 ohms, and for most of the range of frequencies and loads, it's quite a bit closer to 50 ohms. So that's pretty solid performance. One more item on the design. I said in episode number three that I was concerned about the ability of the SI5351 to direct drive the mixer local oscillator input. The reason revolves around the maximum current the SI5351 can supply, and would the 50 ohm impedance of the ADE1ASK be too much of a load for it and cause problems? However, there are plenty of designs on the internet that connect SI5351s to diode ring mixers, and it does work, but maybe not optimally. Without rehashing all those arguments and details, what I ended up doing is building the circuit with a buffer inverter stage at the local oscillator input. That provides a lower load to the SI5351, but I've also included a bypass around it for direct drive, so I could evaluate either method by just soldering on the appropriate components. And in my typical approach, I fabricated my own PC board. Not one of my better efforts, unfortunately. <laughs> I did have a couple of spots that did not transfer and left opens in the circuit, but I can work around those defects by using leaded components instead of surface mount components. Population was a piece of cake. For my initial test, I've not populated the buffer inverter. Instead, I'm coupling the SI5351 output to the mixer through a cap and 220 ohm resistor. I ended up using a leaded RF choke and a leaded 0.1 microfarad cap to bridge the defective traces. The transformer was pretty easy to wind and install as well. I checked the populated board with my multimeter and there's no shorts, so let's get this little guy wired into the rest of the transmitter circuit and test it out. All right, I'm in my lab and I have several setups to go through here to try out this second mixer and see how well it's working. And one of the first things I need to do is verify that I've got proper local oscillator signal strength uh, to drive that mixer. And what I've got set up here, got my 
uh, Arduino with the SI5351, of course, and I've got it set up just for channel zero, and it's going through a little loop of RG316 coax into my power meter, and I'm using my multimeter to get a more accurate reading from my power meter. Now, I've shown this before in a few other episodes, and this is pretty accurate, this setup, and, you know, it's, it's moving around a bit right now because it's really sensitive to just stray RF, but when we get to the power level I'm talking about here, it'll be fine. And speaking of the power level, the mixer uh, that I'm using here, the actual uh, diode ring mixer, is an ADE1 uh, from the ADE, ADE1 family. It's a level 7 mixer, so that means it needs a plus 7 dBm power level on the local oscillator signal to work properly. And more specifically, what that means, if you read into the literature, is that's how much power you want from your local oscillator when it's driving into a non-reactive 50 ohm load. That's basically what I've got here, and that's what we'll check. Now, the SI5351 is adjustable through configuration for four different power levels, and they're rated in milliamps from 2 milliamps to 4 to 6 to 8, and I've set it to 4. Let me power it up. And that seems to be about right. So that's, <clears throat> excuse me, that's about 5.845 volts I'm reading here. And I'll show on screen what the other three look like. And at this level, at 4 milliamps, I'm getting an output around 8.5 uh, dBm, which is a little bit stronger than we need. But that's as fine as I can set it for now because the 2 milliamp is too low. It's 3.3 dBm. And the 6 and the 8 are just too strong. And I'm starting to get into some nonlinearities of my, of my meter. It's really only linear up to about plus 10 dBm, so it's probably even stronger than what I showed on screen there. But nonetheless, I got our proper signal now, and I can proceed to the next step. For this next setup, I'm going to take the first look at the output signal from the second mixer, and I've got it connected up so that the IF signal coming from the IF stage that I went through in the prior episode, that signal's coming into it here, and here's that local oscillator signal that we were just looking at on the power meter coming in here, and then the output is the mixed signal, uh, those two coming out uh, on this coax going into my dummy load. And across the dummy load, I've got my 10 times probe hooked up to the scope, and we'll look at that here shortly to take a look at that signal. And the rest of the setup is the same as I've had in prior episodes. I've got my audio generator here, the audio amp, the double balanced modulator, and then of course the carrier signal here coming in on this coax is from my HP signal generator. That's at 5.5 megahertz carrier signal. So let's switch over to the scope and have a look at what this signal looks like. Okay, and here's the output of the second mixer, and it looks like a hot mess. I mean, what is going on here? That is not one single signal. That is a bunch of stuff. So let me explain what's happening. I'm taking, in this case, a 9.3 megahertz local oscillator. That's what I set the SI5351 to. Um, I'm combining it with the 5.5 megahertz IF. Subtracting them will give me 3.8 megahertz. So for this test, I'm trying to generate a signal that's roughly in the middle of the amateur radio 80 meter band, which would be 3.8 megahertz. Now, in addition to that signal, because that's a diode ring mixer, I'm going to get the sum of those products. In fact, most mixers would do that too, not just a diode ring, but you're going to get the sum and the difference of those signals, and probably along with a little bit of that local oscillator signal coming through as well. So I've got, in addition to the 3.8 megahertz signal that I want, I've got the sum of the local oscillator IF, which would be 14.8 megahertz. I've got some local oscillator at 5.5 megahertz bleeding through. And then probably most significantly to make this really messy looking display here, I've got second order products and third order products, which are combinations of those two signals um, as well. So what to do? Well, need a bandpass filter. That's the most uh, common thing that you would do here. And that's exactly what I showed in my block diagram at, right at the output of the, um, the second mixer board, I'm going to have a bandpass filter, which will take ideally only the 3.8 megahertz signal that I want and reject everything else. So that'll be the next thing I'll do here. I'll connect up that bandpass filter uh, on the output of the, uh, the second mixer and then connect the output of the uh, bandpass filter to the dummy load. And we'll take a look at that. Here's what the setup looks like now. All I've done is I've inserted this little module here that lets me plug in these modular bandpass filters that I constructed for my HF receiver project. And I happen to have the 80 meter one handy. That's why I decided to do this testing uh, on 80 meters. So this is in between the output of the second mixer and the dummy load. So I'll plug this guy in 
And then what we'll do is switch back over to the scope and take a look at what the signal looks like now. Here's the output after putting that bandpass filter in the circuit and hey, it's a lot better now. All that garbage appears to be gone. Now I'm sure there's still some harmonics mixed in there. We're just not going to be able to see them uh, on the scope, but certainly the majority of that stuff is being uh, blocked by the filter. And I can get a rough estimate for the frequency of that signal, even though the 465 doesn't display frequency directly. Just going old school here, looking at the time base here, it's 0.2 microseconds per division. And just taking a quick look here of over four divisions, there's three cycles occurring in there. Doing the math, that works out to about 3.75 megahertz. So it's right on where it should be. Moving along, I've changed the setup yet again. And what I've done, I've removed the dummy load from the output of the bandpass filter. And I've got my step attenuator in its place. And I've got it set right now to about 30 dB of attenuation. And coming out of it through this coax going into my SDR, my Air Spy HF Plus. And I will take a look at the signal on the SDR console software. Now I did something very similar to this earlier um, in this project, just looking at the signal further upstream. And it gave some great insights as to what's going on. And I think we'll see something interesting here too. So let's switch over to the computer now and take a look at the signal. All right, I've got SDR console configured. I've got it set to 3.8 megahertz and have it set to lower sideband. And right now the carrier generator is turned off. Let me turn it on. And there's our single audio tone coming through just fine. Now there's a little bit of garbage down here and that just might be artifact from the Air Spy. It might actually be some Intermod product. Again, this is qualitative, not quantitative. But it does show that it's working and it's very close to where it should be in frequency. I can even turn on that second tone. And we can see and hear them both along with what might be some Intermod products. Uh, I'll look at those a little more closely uh, as I continue to, continue to progress this design. But what I want to do next here, let me turn off the carrier, is go up frequency. Now remember that the uh, uh, 4, uh, 14.8, rather, 14.8 megahertz would be the sum of the, of the 9.3 megahertz local oscillator and the 5.5 megahertz uh, carrier. So let me go up to that and see what we can find there when I turn on the carrier. And there it is. There's a little signal coming through. So that filter is working pretty well. That's uh, kind of down into the noise. And I'll turn it off here. And the other thing we can check is look at how much of the local oscillator is coming through. So go to 5.5 megahertz. Again, I'll turn the carrier back on. And there's a little bit right there, just barely able to see. I can turn it on and turn it off, so I know that's coming from the, from the carrier. So that's looking pretty good. So um, again, this is not something that's going to be able to measure the actual magnitudes, but it's giving a good uh, qualitative assessment of how well this stage is working. All right, and for the final performance measurement that I'm going to do for this episode, let's take a look at the output of this circuit on my spectrum analyzer. And if you're not familiar with my channel, you might say, hey, wait a minute. That's a 465 oscilloscope. That's not a spectrum analyzer. Well, actually, this is the front end display for my home built spectrum analyzer. And I've shown it in a few other projects and other episodes of how it works and uh, how I built it. But for the purpose of today, I've got it set up so that the reference level at the top of the screen is minus 20 dBm. And it doesn't uh, display or measure, I should say, frequency. Um, it's more of a qualitative display in frequency, but definitely quantitative in magnitude. This is calibrated to 10 dB per division. So let me turn on the carrier signal. And there it is. There's our first pip. That's the primary output at 3.8 megahertz. Now it's right at the top of the reference level. That's minus 20 dBm, like I said. I was targeting minus 15 for coming out of that filter, so it's a little lower than I thought. So I might have more losses in the filter than I uh, planned for. I might have some losses in the cabling. And again, this is all set up kind of crudely on, on the workbench. But we can look at some of these other products here too. And let me turn it on and off a few times so we can see which ones are products. So there's some minor ones down here, but this one right here, that of course is that upper sideband um, at 14.8 megahertz is coming through the filter. And it's at, let's see, minus 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, about minus 75, 73 dBm. So that's quite a bit lower than the lower sideband signal. And there's really no carrier uh, coming through. We did see it on the SDR, but it's not really quantifying it here. 
uh, on the on the spectrum analyzer. So all in all, this looks really good. That's it for today's episode. Thanks very much for watching. And as always, I hope you're enjoying this series. A couple comments before I wrap up this episode. Uh, first one is I really could put this transmitter on the air right now. I mean, it's putting out a decently clean signal. The only issue, of course, is it's very weak. You know, minus 20 dBm is only 10 microwatts. That's barely enough to communicate in CW, let alone to try to communicate in single sideband. And of course, the rest of the analog stage in this is all about boosting that power up. And I'm trying to hit a target around 20 to 30 watts by the time all is said and done, which should be fine to communicate on most of the amateur HF bands that I have in mind. The other thing I would comment on is I did gloss over that uh, SI5351 power setting. Um, I did pick the 4 milliamps. It seems to be working just fine without that buffer inverter. But I do want to go back and look at that a little more closely. Maybe I will solder those components in and give it a try and see if I get slightly better performance. But certainly what I saw so far and as far as the cleanliness of that, single, uh, cleanliness of that signal on the spectrum analyzer looked just fine. And of course... I haven't forgotten about this guy, my HW101 project. I am kind of stuck on trying to make a decision on how to do the, the, the painting. And I will say thanks for the suggestions you guys have left and the comments on that project. I've got some great ideas. I just need to pick one and get working with it and get this guy done. So until next time, bye for now.